Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is H Melt. Um, I work at Women and Children First Bookstore, Chicago's feminist bookstore. I would like to begin tonight's event by acknowledging the land on which Women and Children First sits is the occupied territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor native histories, literature, and communities. We encourage you to research whose land you're on in your own homes and communities. Women and Children First is currently open to the public for in-store shopping Tuesday through Sundays from noon to six. We are also processing online orders every single day, have curbside pickup and ship across the country. We are continuing to do virtual events for the foreseeable future. Um, one I am looking forward to happening next week is an event for an anthology called Sweeter Voices Still, um, which is all about queer Midwestern life. Um, that is next Wednesday, June 23rd. You can watch recordings of past virtual events here on our Crowdcast channel or on YouTube with closed captioning. Just so you know, video of tonight's event will be immediately available to rewatch and share following our program. Tonight, I am excited to welcome uh, two brilliant writers. Tonight, we have T. Kara Mahilani Madden, author of Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, and Chris Belk, whose book, The Natural Mother of the Child, released earlier this week. As a trans writer myself, reading this book felt incredibly natural to me. It felt like family, messy and exhausting, but also full of love and tenderness, along with many unpredictable moments. Belk writes, we can only really know once we're there. A line that speaks so much to trans life, to family making, to partnership, I can't tell you how many times a week I recommend books to people who have trans folks in their families. I know this book will mean even more to trans people themselves who are creating their own families too. Tonight, we will start off with some reading followed by conversation and questions at the end. Uh, please feel free to put any questions you have throughout the evening in the ask a question box at the bottom of your screen. And please, please, please note that green button that says buy the book. That will take you directly to Women and Children First website um, where you can purchase The Natural Mother of the Child, this incredible book. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Thanks for being here, everyone. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for coming, everyone. Thank you, H. Melt, for that amazing introduction. And thank you to Takira for this conversation that I am so excited to have. Um, I was just telling her that I've been wanting to talk to her about her book forever. So this is my excuse to um, get to do that and talk a little bit about mine as well. So my book is The Natural Mother of the Child. Um, it came out on Tuesday, and um, I'm going to read two very short sections about um, mothers. I draw the map as quickly as I can on the back of a student's homework in marker. I am late for work. I am stressed because I do not trust your mother with our children, but she is all we have today. When you were little, she took you and your brothers across Poland by herself on the train. I try to imagine it, you and Pete and Jack and your mother with your backpacks, your childhood bangs and hair plated behind you, but I can't. I have never met that mother. Your mother asks me what to feed the kids for lunch while I am putting, my while I am putting on my shoes and I say peanut butter and jelly. She asks how to make it. I tell her, you take two slices of bread and you, oh, never mind, I'll just do it. And I do. Samson hanging from my legs and Sean asking when I will be back. 
345 at the latest, I say, as if that means a thing to a three-year-old. To him, a clock is just a circle on the wall. Today is just another day when his parents don't have enough time. I'm always rushed, always inattentive, and it feels like my whole salary goes to our babysitter who cannot be here today. To Sean, today is not Monday, it's just today. And, your, and his grandmother has arrived unexpectedly from New York to keep him alive. Your babcha is gonna take you to playgroup, I say. It will be fun, I instruct him. Playgroup is the place you go to make parenting easier. All the weary moms and nannies nursing free cups of tea, a room full of old plastic toys you hope your kids won't lick, circle time, plates of goldfish crackers and raisins, time ticking by. I think about giving your mother verbal directions to the old brown brick church on Montgomery Avenue, but then I decide to draw a map. It is harder to get to playgroup than it is to make a peanut butter sandwich. When peanut butter came to Warsaw, you told me, nobody knew what to do with it. We thought maybe it was like butter, that you used it on a ham sandwich. Then we realized it wasn't like butter, but we would use it with butter like it was the ham. Here's Frankfurt, I say, drawing a fat road going north and south, ignoring that it is one of Philadelphia's narrowest main streets. And here's Montgomery, drawing a thin line where she turned east toward the river, the highway, the church. You turn away from the train tracks. Your mother takes the map in her hands, looks at me with watery blue eyes. Thank you, she says. I cannot quite pin down what bothers me so much about her. I imagine it's mostly about me, but these days I do not have time for much introspection. At 3.45, I rush in the door after a day of teaching everyone else's kids, and Sean tells me they did not make it to play group. Bob Chow turned the stroller the wrong way, he says, and I think we went to where the wild things are. The tunnel past Lehigh, graffiti and discarded needles, ominous shadows and pieces of concrete strewn on the sidewalk. No stores, no other strollers, no play group. It's all blown out up there. Weeks later, she will go to her local ER when she gets lost coming home from the grocery store. There will be a mass. Until most of it is taken out, your mother will not know what it is. Glioblastoma multiform, the worst possible news. MRI can provide a map to the tumor, but only tells us so much about what it might be. We can only really know once we're there. The other day you came home from work and reported that a new doctor in your ER told you her father died of a massive heart attack peacefully in his sleep at a roadside motel on the way to Florida for the winter. It must have felt like a blessing talking with someone about death like that, a clean, easy death in an emergency room where no one meets an easy end. Your coworker's mother went to the front desk to ask what state they were even in. My husband is dead in his bed. Your mother never got to be old. She was a gym teacher, not even 60, tight and lithe and full of energy. She had thin muscular arms and strong hands that were bigger than mine. When you told me 12 years ago that your parents were searching for a house in Colorado, you paused, then added, not that kind of Colorado, like middle of nowhere Colorado, cheap Colorado. It was their first real home together. Your mother had an apartment in Warsaw because she grew up in an orphanage and an apartment was the state's compensation for such a childhood. Sometimes you try to talk about how small the apartment is, but in every tale, it gets smaller until when you tell of it, you can press the walls apart with your hands. Your mother used to tell a story about getting a broken watch as a gift and still showing it off. It was one of the only things she owned. She was proud when anyone asked her the time. You asked her to stop telling that story, but she wouldn't. Their apartment in Queens felt sterile, like they'd never moved in, like a hospital. They've been here a decade, you said, but they don't think of this as their home. Your parents kept renting their little place in New York, waiting for their trips to Colorado. Our first time in Bailey, Colorado was my first time on a mountain. The house was beyond the middle of nowhere. After we had sex, I was so dizzy, and I kept waking all night wondering if I was dying for lack of air. We started doing it on the floor because I thought the few feet would help and it was creepy doing it in your parents' bed. I was 19. They were back in New York. You told me about how your whole childhood they dragged you up seemingly every mountain in Southern Poland and you hated it. Your mother lived to hike. I'd never been hiking and thought it was at least worth a shot. By the back door of the house, your mother had left two pairs of boots. We all had the same size feet. 
She had a stack of maps of the mountains of Colorado and some mantras scrawled on index cards that she taped by the door. So she'd see them right before she went out hiking. They were all about how nature would and could crush us if we weren't wary. When she'd get depressed, you worried she'd die up there by herself on purpose, going out when she knew there was a storm coming, throwing herself off the side of the mountain even. She was an expert navigator and you'd know she meant it if she did. And so what? Why should somebody have to die the way we want to give us the story we want to tell? I'll stop there. I want to clap for you. <laughs> so we can pretend we can hear everyone in this room <laughs> clapping. Thank you so much for reading that. And what a beautiful example of just how expansive this book is. Um, it's just, I feel like so often we are, um, our, our work is kind of like reduced to one headline of what a book is about. And this book is about so many things and expansive love and familiar units in really unexpected ways. So thank you for reading that excerpt. I'm so happy to be here. Um, thanks for everyone, everyone else for being here as well. Um, Chris, I thought I would start with something we talked about before the event began, which is um, not exactly why you wrote in this form, but I guess I'm interested in the question about why you wrote in this form um, and how you found it. I find so often when people ask like why fragmented work, why fractured narrative, um, there's a suggestion that we are breaking like a normative form of how uh, stories should be told and how nonfiction stories should be told chronologically. So I'm interested in your thinking through like how this actually took shape. Yeah, I, I really like that the question kind of like includes this um, idea of normative and non-normative storytelling because I don't think that telling things in temporal order is normative. That doesn't, that's okay. not how like I was thinking a lot while I was starting to write about um, like when I tuck my kids into bed, I'm always like, what was the best part of your day? And we like talk about our day and they would like say stuff. And then I would be like, first we woke up in the morning and we ate chocolate chip muffins. And then we went to this place and I was like, why am I doing this? This is not like, I'm trying to like force their life into a narrative form that like I, don't necessarily, they're not, that's not how they naturally are remembering things. I'm kind of like almost imposing this idea about how we tell stories onto them. Um, so that was like kind of disturbing to me in a way, because I, <laughs> I realized that when I was writing, it was like, I tend to write shorter pieces just as a writer. I feel like between 500 and 1000 words is like where I say what I want to say. And a lot of things will be like, in a fragment and then the next fragment's like kind of about the same thing but a different time or place or or something slightly like different about it but i noticed that when i was writing like a thousand word piece it would have these like digressions in it that were basically like if you took you know it's like old school like xerox forms where like all the things are like happening at the same time and you're just kind of like writing down and like every you know like past and present are kind of like simultaneously occurring. So I'm like losing my mind, making this peanut butter sandwich when I'm already late for work. But in the back of my mind, there's like this sort of funny anecdote about like, we didn't know what peanut butter even was when we can't, you know, like when we <laughs> got it, like that, I, there are all these stories Anna tells like, well, when the wall fell and then she like talks about how they just had no context for some of the like new items that they had access to like in her childhood. So it's like, a way to have tonal interruptions where you can have something that's like super devastating, mm -hmm. like someone diagnosed with an illness that is going to kill them um, within two years. And then um, like also have these sort of like funny things happening. Cause I don't think that the, that my, my personal mind works in a way where I can just like say things without other things interrupting. That's just not like my, I'm always reminded of other things while I'm thinking. I have a very associative mind. So for me, this is like a natural mode of storytelling. If I tried to be Tara Westover and write educated, I could, that's not, that would take like 
a skill and craft that's not part of my skill set. It's not like I decided like I'm gonna fracture this narrative. I was like, I'm trying the memoir. A memoir is a story of a life, and I'm trying to tell the story of my life. And the way that I conceive of it is in this. This is what comes out. You know, like this mm -hmm. is not that there's not a craft to the individual pieces, but it's like this is like literally a representation of the way that I think about my own life, and I want people to have access to that. If they're going to have access to me, they're going to also have to have access to like the way that I think about things. Um, and I don't know, I think as a writer, I, I'm curious what you think about this, but I think as a writer, there's like a freshness to sitting down and having had like the previous day you ended something and you're still writing the story of your life, but there's already a lot of endings in that story. And it like lends sort of like an excitement and a freshness to writing a new like shard of it to me. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of my follow up is just to, to geek out on craft a little bit. You, every piece, and we talked a little bit about how you're drawn to flash pieces and so am I. Um, both Chris and I studied fiction um, and I think got degrees in fiction before debuting with memoirs, which I find really interesting with fractured um, flash pieces of memoir. And um, I'm always interested on a craft point of view, like how do you find shape um, to these tiny pieces rather than the book as a whole? Like there's such, there's such energy and engine to these fragments that you've written from you know 300 to a thousand words or whatever they are. And I think for me, it's it's this, beautiful lyricism and musicality that you find in your sentences, but how do you think through structure of the tiny pieces themselves rather than the whole as well? Like, how do you find that energy? And you're so good at endings and I just want to learn from you. How do you, how do you see the shape of something tiny? I appreciate you saying that I'm good at endings because I do feel like it's a book that asks a lot of questions that don't have answers but i was mm -hmm. like i do know how to end a scene so i can just like trick people give them like ten thousand <laughs> false and you know they feel the satisfaction of getting to an ending like over and over and over and over again but then at the yeah. real ending it's like but it's not like a an ending where you find out the answer to any of you know mm -hmm. to any of it. i am a big fan when i write i write a lot in like the mega paragraph and some of the fragments in the book are like maintain that form and sometimes i was like you're not zabald you need to like hit enter you know this is <laughs> like i i tried to to not have it like if it wasn't working it wasn't working but when i write i usually write um like a long like long paragraph style is my starting point just like some poets start in couplets like that's my natural the mega paragraph is like my natural form um as far as like keeping flashes tight and making them like a contained piece, I, this is gonna sound really weird to a lot of writers, but I conceive of like writing as pages, like the page is like a, a an art unit. And I would like have the text be this, whatever size it needed to be so that the fragment could exist on one page. And, um, I was like wanting readers to like, my, I was reading it at first. So I was like, when I turn the page, I wanna like control the experience that a reader has on the next page. And it's mm -hmm. gonna have like a cert, it's gonna have like a seed idea. Like I was late for work and my mother-in-law was there, but it's gonna have like these thematic things and like uh, other ideas interrupting and humor and like sadness and MR, what is an MRI and like all, you know, all of those things. But I was like, I, it, they all existed basically on one page and the whole book when I pr first printed a draft was like a hundred pages of things on one page. Um, I, ha I heard Sarah Rose Etter talk about this too, about the Book of X, how it was all originally everything on one page. So I guess there are other <laughs> people who are deranged in this way. <laughs> uh, but I love that book too, because those fragments also had such a containment and an energy to them. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote the book in InDesign. I took it out of Word very early on to write, to, to oh, kind wow. of compile it. Um, and I did most of the writing directly into that document. So I did have like a lot of page control and I was like theming the page, like when they kind of 
I think it's easy to read, like read through it fast and be like, they're kind of in a random order, but I did have like, I want the reader to be like with my mother-in-law and then with my mother and then with my mother-in-law, like kind of like switching all those things around. But I do have, like when I'm working on a flash, it's very much like it has a seed event. There's at least two themes that have to come in or else it's not, it's not like viable. You know, it was like one of the ones that just like didn't make it. Um, because I do think like I'm, I, you're also an editor and I'm an editor and I edit flash nonfiction pretty much exclusively. And I think that a lot of the flash that we think is about one moment is only successful if there's like at least a couple of other things happening. They're just often very subtle. Um, it's like almost like an effect that you don't even notice unless you're like actually like breaking it down or editing the work. Um, and you're kind of like highlighting like where do these other ideas come in? But yeah, I have like pretty annoying rules for myself about like what is viable and what, what <laughs> isn't. Um, and that the piece that I read was two flashes and the second one um, is the only, I think the only part of the book that ends on a question mark, which I kept going back and being like, am I allowed, is this part of my, like what I'm allowed to do for myself? Like, am I allowed to end like this? Is this a satisfying ending? Um, I ended up like deciding it was okay, but I think I'm still like, is that a satisfying way to end that particular like rumination on something? Um, I don't know. Yeah, sorry, I that was so. really, that was like a really long, long <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, I think so. It's it's a way to sneak in that suspense at the end. Just that a question mark? Yeah. A tip for all of us. <laughs> Like, wait, what? And you then that. you turn the page and it's like something totally different going on because it's not because it's me. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. What do you think, Chris? You're not telling me. You're still <laughs> Um, I'm interested in, I, so I hear this advice a lot um, in academic spaces specifically that you need, with nonfiction, you need time to reflect on things before you can write about them in a work of nonfiction. Um, that you need years, you need to digest it. Um, and that's not advice I've ever taken. Uh, mm -hmm. And in this book, what I find really interesting is you have so much content from your past and your childhood and your family, but also so much content that feels very much written in real time or in the present action of the story as, as it was when you were writing it. Um, and I'm curious about your own process through writing. Like how does that change the relationship to the writing and the crafting itself? Do you feel that you need that time, that, that time and space for reflection to really nail it down, or does it just feel different piece by piece? I think it's it is such an academic space thing. I've never heard that in like a community workshop or just like talking to people. They're you know, but I feel mm -hmm. like in workshop I've heard that all the time. Like give given as advice to someone if they turned in something where the form wasn't quite working or something about it with like the balance was off like whatever the main issue may have like it's not my job to diagnose someone else's work but whatever the issue would have been instead it was like the workshop leader would pivot and be like why don't you wait two years and then mm -hmm. you know and i'm like well why don't we just try it a different way like right i so i had this like I'm really glad that I went to writing school because I never would have like stopped being an elementary school teacher and actually started writing things if I didn't personally go to the MFA. Um, I took a literature course that was on life writing and I, it was like not, it was not only about memoir and it was about like British literature, which I know nothing about at all. Um, and I just kind of like signed up for this class cause like you should do new things, I guess. And we read um, Moments of Being by Virginia Woolf. We read like her, she had these two memoir attempts at very different times in her life where they both described the same things. Like they're both about the death of her mother when she was a child and kind of like the mood of her home. And a lot of people have just spent, I mean, it's Virginia Woolf. So scholars spend their whole career like trying to figure out what the subtext is of like literally every clause and every sentence. But what I took away from it was like, both of these pieces of writing are really like deeply engaging and they're like such an interesting take on like what the meaning of life is. And there are things that she had later in her life, both like in terms of her writing craft, but also just her perspective on her childhood that like 
makes it for an amazing thing to read those things together. Um, mm -hmm. And what I took from that was just like, you can write about things at any time. You just have to do a good job of like, it's just, you know, you're, you're going to have a different perspective. I have a different perspective on the events that happened like in almost real time as I was writing now. If I had to write about those mm -hmm. things now, I have different ideas about what they meant and I have different takes on them and I probably would choose different details and um, I highlight different things that like people say a lot of things, but I chose to give the reader like only some of what they were saying. So I, I don't think that you necessarily like, it's not a matter of gaining or losing. And I think that when people are nonfiction writers, like I don't have an interesting life, so I'm probably gonna write about a lot of this stuff again in some form. It's gonna just like have my new and improved brain on it. Um, I do think that for me personally, I think the last section of the book, which happens in the very present, like it's the only real, it's the only time that really like the book is a sustained look at a shorter period of time. And I was writing it like literally the, the text is like, Samson is five and a half years old. And he like was actually five and a half years old when I was writing it. And I think that that last section like is some of the strongest writing I've ever been able to do myself. You know, I hope that I keep getting better. But for me, when I wrote that section, I was like, I'm really in this right now. And I think that some of the sections about my childhood are great and I have like an interesting take on them, but I, I don't, I, I, from my personal experience writing this one book, it would be false for me to say that I can't produce good things about things that happened last week. Cause I, that's what I did. Like, mm -hmm. I just, you know, for me, I don't know what other, other people might read the book and be like, it was great till the end, but then he really went off the rails. But I, that's not how I feel about it. I feel like there is, um, a rawness to the way that you feel about things that just happen that you can never get back. You can gain a lot of things with distance, like perspective on it and you mature and like whatever, but you're never gonna feel in it again. So I like that I got to be in it and feel it. Um, so yeah, that's another long answer to a sh short question, but I feel like that advice, it makes sense why people give it, but I always think that it's helpful to give advice that is helping people do what they wanna do and not telling them not to do it. I don't know that they're, I mean, unless someone's writing something that's like wildly like racist or inappropriate or revealing information about people that they shouldn't, I think as a facilitator of someone else's writing, you should say like, I see that you're trying to do this and I'm going to help you do that instead of being like, why don't you wait three years and then write about it? It's like, that's not actually good advice because this is what I want to work on right now. Um, but to add one more thing, <laughs> um, there are things that I try I, I, and I, I, I assume that this may be true for you too, that there are things in your memoir, which is also like, very expansive and covers just like a lot of things that happen, but also ideas that you have where I tried to write about things and it didn't work. And then I wrote about it successfully later, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't have done the first thing. Like I was working through it and that's like useful for me as a writer to do in order to produce the right work later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I thought the end of your book in that last act was so powerful, that kind of present action and ending right there. Um, and I, I have a similar movement in my book in the third act is this present action, like things being revealed after I sold my book um, and I was writing it like up to the print deadline. And when I read this, I felt, I felt that permission again, that sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes you need perspective, sometimes you need distance, but sometimes like writing your way through it really is a way to write your way through it. And there is such, kind of what you're saying, there's this energy that you can't really get back if you don't do that sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the narrow definition of what a memoir is, unfortunately, like, involves it having one tone where there's not like the different voices and different tones that you would have if you're like, I'm gonna write these like bursts of childhood and then I'm gonna later have this like more present action. Like I'm excited by books that have all of that happening, but I think that other people think of memoir as something like 
all these things happen to you and you have an idea of what they all mean and you're going to tell the reader what they all mean versus like I know what some things mean but I'm still working on other things that's like very exciting to me to read yeah me too and this book is just so textured the multimedia the the photographs the documents the fragments like it's just such a blast to read everyone if you haven't picked it up yet um it's just incredible it just from the very first pages i was like i have to teach this book i have to teach this opening it's everything about lyricism and suspense and heart it's so beautiful um i, I that so much my editor was like i don't remember if it was my editor but they're like are you sure this isn't like a prologue or chapter one and i was like no it's not it's not that it's just like the beginning i don't mm -hmm. want it to be like part of the table of contents it's just like tonal stage setting. I had like weirdly strong opinions about that, that maybe I don't hold anymore. But at the time I was like, <laughs> I just want it not to be like tethered to anything else that happens. Yeah. Um, I'm curious in terms of, you know, the, the publication, congratulations on the publication of this book and it being out in the world as of this week. I find that often those systemically marginalized, um, our, our books, especially nonfiction works and memoirs are often reduced to like educational texts and we become experts or pundits on um, a group or community of people who um, are then, ha then have this gaze of like, this book is going to tell me how to act and how to learn. And we saw this last summer with anti-racist texts. So I'm curious, how are you grappling with that both in the text and, and this week as a person who's just published this book um, during Pride Month? Like, did you make certain formal decisions in the book itself to kind of avoid that gaze? I think that, that that's the main, if I had to say what the direct address is for, it's to avoid over explaining because it's like weird and false to be like, let me sit down and tell a story to my mom about what it means that I'm a person like that. That is like a false hat to put on and it wouldn't make for good writing. So I think that as a technique allows for a level of intimacy where you're like mm -hmm. truly trying to like, it is about bridging gaps, but it's not about bridging the gap of like, I'm going to tell you about like when the word non-binary was first introduced into like common, right? Like, but I think that some, some trans books are like that. And I think that they're so valuable, like to people and to me as a like reading just stuff like that is so meaningful, but because those books exist, then I can be like, I'm not doing any, I'm literally not doing any of that. I have no interest in that as, as an artistic endeavor. Um, and I felt extremely freed from that pressure for a number of reasons. So like, the first reason is that um, I did go, I did write a lot of it in an MFA program where there were a lot of other trans people kind of like randomly there at that time. Um, it was in a very, it's in, in the UP in Michigan and it's like kind of in the middle of nowhere, but like everyone's trans. Like it was a very kind of like perfect storm of people who came to the program when I did. Um, so I was used to always having one, at least one other trans person in workshop every time. I never didn't have um, trans readers and my like person that would come over and write with me as trans. Um, so that was a gift. I also like never received any um, pressure from either my agent or editor to make it different. Um, like they did like very skilled editing that helped the book so much, especially telling me like, where I wasn't, you know, where I needed, where I needed most to put my attention, like just kind of like putting a flag in. But in terms of like, you, you should turn this into a book where you're explaining transness, you're giving more information about this or that, or you're telling it in an order that makes more sense. Like that was not ever part of the equation of this, which I feel like incredibly blessed about and know that that is not true for a lot of people who are like doing memoir or nonfiction. Um, I just got very lucky with all aspects of creating this art, which I worry is never going to happen. It's like that that's never going to happen. It's just like very lucky. Um, and yeah, I, I I mean I'm I am marginalized in some ways, but I'm also like a middle class white guy. So there's like yes, I'm stepping into a genre that's like not 
that where there's not a lot of diversity and what kinds of stories get told, but I'm kind of like very easily acceptable as a person to put in that like first slot in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so I do wish that there, I mean, I wish in general that in parenting stories, there was more diversity in like what's happening. It's like one of the most like heavily restrained genres, I think. And critics keep writing about how white and middle-class and cis female centric the genre of motherhood writing even is, but that doesn't change who gets published somehow. So um, yeah, it's hard. And it's hard to be asked about trans things that I know nothing about. I'm not a medical practitioner. I don't, I'm not a professional trans person in any way. I'm not an attorney. I don't know. I don't, I mean, I'm a teacher, so I don't know about a lot of that stuff. And I try just to say like, there's experts on this and you should come, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to pretend that I have the expertise. I mean, I do think that I know a lot about breastfeeding and <laughs> compared to most people. So I feel like if someone asks me questions about like trans people breastfeeding, that's something that I really feel like I know a lot about. But in terms of like, should trans people play sports? What do you think of these laws? I'm like, I, I think that it's all bad, but I can't talk any more about it. Like, I just don't have anything to say about it. Yeah. Well, again, the book is just so dynamic in what it covers, including the, the love and the joy and the care in this book um, beyond, again, the headline of trans parenthood. There's so much more that you explore about lineage in this book. Um, and it's, it's again, so beautiful. It's one of my favorite books in the world. Uh, we're going to open up for questions soon. So just, yeah, drop your questions in whenever. Um, I guess, Chris, um, maybe we'll end on, you just published this gorgeous piece in Lit Hub about, um, cooking as care for the family. And there's so many beautiful and tender cooking scenes in this book. And I'm curious for you in this past year, year and a half of the pandemic and beyond that with so many, so many of us and so many writers, I'm sure in the audience with, with, with caretaking responsibilities, what does the work look like for you? And what is the work outside of the work? Like how can you practice and be engaged in the world or in the world of your project creatively perhaps in ways other than those hours that you're able to spend at the document um, or the, the Photoshop formatting, however you said that yeah. you put this <laughs> together, which I'm yeah. amazed by. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of like physical collaging too that ended up like not, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't look like the cut and paste childhood projects that I was originally <laughs> making. Um, it's really hard. I think that anyone who is like caregiving at this time is, is in it. Um, it's difficult. I have been through a lot of fights with myself about what I should be writing at this time. I should be writing fiction. I should be going back. Like you said, you're going back to fiction. I was like, I should go back to my short stories. I should, I don't know, come up with some new idea of fiction that would excite me. Um, and instead, I, I really have just tried to be generous with myself and allowing myself to keep writing like flash nonfiction because it makes me happy and I like it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I keep being like, but it's too similar to other things you've done. And I'm like, the book is not that long. I'm older, like, you know, there's not like a limited amount of time. And I, I have really tried to turn to writers who have written life writing in all different kinds of ways, like over the span of a lengthy career and just kind of like, read like Melissa Phoebus's books, like all of them and been like, mm -hmm. this is like someone is working on like the story of a life and the world and research like in all different kinds of like methods. And I'm allowed to engage in that project. Like it doesn't mean that I'm writing a second memoir. It's just like, I have to have grace with the fact that I'm writing these flash nonfiction pieces that are basically subtitled like, and another thing, <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> writing about the same themes and ideas. Um, and what really inspired me to write that Lit Hub essay is that I started writing a series of flash essays about dinners that I was making. Like I was like, my prompt generator that's in my head is no longer functioning in the way that it was before. Um, and the only thing that's a constant in my life is that I have to produce food for children at all hours of the day. I'm just like, in the kitchen like a short order cook all the time because you can't tell kids like like i'm like i don't 
I feel a little depressed, so I'm going to eat like Reese's puff cereal and go to bed. You can't do that with your kids. <laughs> you can't be like, I don't feel good. So have crackers and a soda and go to bed. Like you can't do that. So <laughs> I, I was allowing myself to be like, I'm cooking through all of these like feelings of being trapped. And I work in a super grim day job in a medical clinic. And I have a lot of thoughts about that. And just like, I cooking is the one thing where I'm like able to really have like clarity of mind while I'm doing it. So I'm like, I have to do it, but I also want to do it. And that's when my like creative mind gets going. Um, and I think it's really important for writers who do like caregiving work or have like demanding day jobs or whatever to give themselves like grace in the time that they spend mentally in their projects being real time. Um, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not like a word. I think there's like a little bit of like a word count obsession and how fast people are putting out. And I'm just kind of like, I'm trying not to engage in that as much and just engage in like, my mind has produced things that I have enjoyed. So I need to have it like primed so that I can keep doing that and be, you know, like a person who keeps writing and doesn't just give up and hide and never do it again. We have about 10 minutes for questions, y'all. No um, questions, come on. Anything at all, everyone. Chat box or the question box. I, I mean, I have 12 pages of questions. I, I know, keep buddy. Going, but. <laughs> 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 That's a great question. Um, yes, serious eats halal cart chicken is something that my children will always eat and it's like infinitely scalable and made with things that I usually have. So that is like the go to like nobody's been eating my dinners and I'm feeling pretty upset about it. And I also can get them to eat almost anything that's like taco like i can just prepare any food and put it in taco form as long as it has like a good salsa on top so those are that's my like lazy and then the like not lazy is that serious eats halal cart chicken could not recommend it enough <laughs> i mean <laughs> more food questions are are good we have two questions in the chat box, fictional or otherwise, who are some of your favorite depictions of parents and children? Oh, and a compliment on our excellent shirts, <laughs> which uh, was accidental that we both just felt like colorful flowers were the mood for tonight. Um, I am so glad that I didn't try to read Lydia Kiesling's novel. Um, while I had a toddler, I think I would have had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> um, but I read it when um, my youngest ZZ was like four um, and I was like smugly out of that time of my life um, at, you know, at the time. I'm always like in the book, I talk about how we like talk about having more kids. So that's like an open question in my life that I'm very open about. But um, at the time I was done with having young kids. So I cannot, describe how shockingly accurate it is about the demoralizing dailiness of having a toddler specific specific to toddler time um so that book is one of my favorite but also harrowing descriptions of having a toddler um elisa albert's after birth is a really great novel about like the immediate postpartum period um i really also kind of harrowing and I wouldn't recommend it if you like just had a baby, don't give it as like a baby shower gift <laughs> um, because it's very much about like feeling suddenly very alone after you have a baby. Those are two, those are like the two novels that I feel um, like are really great. Um, as far as there's not a lot of literature about dads at all, um, but Chris, what is his last name? But Shelder, I think is how you say it. Abbott Awaits is a novel in Flash that's about um, a summer. Like it's like the professor has summer vacation and it's like all these little interactions with um, his family. And I really 
that's like really smart and funny. And it's just like such a good example of flash, a flash compilation. Um, yeah, those are my favorite parenting baby related things. I also love mom blogs. That's like how I started writing nonfiction. So like, you know, I think that it's a great art form. And I wish that Instagram hadn't taken over like the long form mom blog. I miss it. Another question from Michelle. The book seems so personal. How do you establish boundaries as to what you are willing to write or share with your readers? I'm like a kind of like open person. Um, I am not. I feel like I'm, I have a reserved affect when you first meet me, but I'm not like reserved in like what I like kind of share about myself. So that wasn't particularly difficult, but as a writer, I think that there's like, how do you decide what to put in? And I think um, the place where I had the hardest time with that is there's a section in the book that I get asked about every time I talk about the book, except this time, which is nice, but now I'm about to start talking about it. There's a section about anger and my dad and just like recognizing anger as a part of myself that I don't like um, or didn't like. I, I don't, I feel like I've moved, moved on and matured from a lot of the like negative thoughts and behaviors I, I had that I wrote about in, in the book. But in that I was, um, I received that kind of like writing advice where it's like, you should write more about this. Or like, you know, when you go to a workshop and people are like more of this and more of that. And I'm like, it's, an 8,000 word essay that you're trying to turn into a 20 million word essay. That's not, that's not what this is. So um, I didn't want to say more. I, I was like open to lots of kinds of editing about um, anger and my, how I feel it's part of like my inheritance from my, my birth family and you know, like that kind of stuff. I, I had a hard time there because I wanted to set a hard limit and kept getting prompts to like explore further what it was exactly. And I was like, this is not, you know, this doesn't make me feel comfortable. I still feel nauseous when I like look at that part of the book. I'm not gonna do that to myself anymore. Um, but I think in terms of like self scrutiny, I really wanted to like put a pretty hard lens on myself and really, um, kind of fight the desire that people have to have trans people be very like eager for acceptance. Um, I don't, I didn't want that to be part of this book. I understand why that sentiment exists in the writing and why in the editing and publishing, especially look at who's editing and publishing. So I understand why it makes it into some trans narratives, especially like the old, you know, the farther you go back and read them. Um, but I was very much like, I want to put the parts about myself, mostly like crippling ambivalence that I just like think are really um, important for me to explore in the book. And finally, my kids were at an age where I felt like I was writing about them almost as if they're like not real people yet, because they just, they're very, they're in the book in a very flat, like they're just, you see flashes of them, but they're, I didn't try to like introduce them fully as people to the reader, really. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. You were discussing earlier how you've given yourself grace in terms of how much writing you do because of your job and family. After a long day or week or month, what activities are generative for you in terms of your creative work? And you did talk about prompting yourself. I'm more, I'm interested in that too. Yeah, a lot of the stuff in the book. So like, I did write a lot of it in a writing program, which is like an amazing gift of time that most people will never get. So I, I think I'm very grateful that my family was on board with me, like quitting life and moving them to an MFA program for a while. Um, but I also had an eight month old and no childcare during the MFA. When we got there the first semester, I just like literally had this baby on my back everywhere. So it's not like it was the most ideal time for creation either. And a lot of the things in the book were prompts that I gave myself also. Um, like for example, the, there's like this section that's all short essays that are about words that first appeared in the dictionary the year that I was born. And I was like, I, I remember being like, I'm on winter break, my kids are on winter break, like this is grim. My partner was working five or six nights a week to like, cause she's like, now you're off work so I can sign up every single day and like actually make money. 
Um, and it was just so grim and demoralizing, like, cause it, there was also like 10,000 feet of snow. And I was like, if I don't have like something that's fun formally, I will never be able to write anything. So that is my advice, like all one for generating anything, but then secondarily for writing about really hard things. Cause I was able to write about a lot of the really hard things because it was fun to do it in the forms. I, it was fun to cut up my birth certificate in, into a million pieces and use that as like a prolonged prompt for writing. And I was able to write about things that I didn't think when I sat down to write, like I didn't think I'd be able to write about like the very complex feelings I have about like my mother-in-law and her death and how I feel a lot of regret about the way that our relationship was. Um, but I was able to, cause I was like, it'll be fun. You will write like three flash essays that have to do with the word mother, you know, like they're all just like totally made up prompts. And that personally helps me a lot. It's wonderful. Um, I think that's time for us. Thank you again, everyone, women and children, everyone for being here. And Chris, this was, I feel like we could talk for so many more hours. I, I this wish flew I, by. One day we'll, we'll hang out in person and we can talk craft for a prolonged period of time. That would be that. so fun. I would love that so um, much. Thank you both so much. Uh, thank you, Chris Bell. Thank you, T. Kira, Mahelani Madden. Thank you um, to the audience for being here. Please don't forget to hit that green button to grab this book. Um, it is beautiful. It has many images in it. And thank you all so much. I hope you have a great evening and weekends. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Aishmael. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have good a night. really good, good night, everyone. Be well, be 